but they're both yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. We have a couple of minutes to spare. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> perfect. Joven, could you uh, uh, allow me to share? Yes. Thank you. Uh, let me try and see that it works. You are co-host now? I forgot where I had you earlier, sorry. Excuse me? Uh, uh, you are co-host, you are allowed to share, yes. Okay, so I will stop your sharing just to make sure that it really works. that I'm sharing the right one and so on. Is it sharing? Can anyone confirm? Yes. OK, that's like, yeah. Uh, I'll Right now, the mode is more like a practice mode, I think. You, you may need to try full screen if you want to share the full screen. Full screen. Uh, ah, no. Uh, OK. That's right. Okay. It's yeah. not. So So what am I going to How is it now? I think you need to in the. Mm -hmm. Now or is it, how is it okay? Uh, I think that right now it's more like a PowerPoint mode that uh, you can do editing, but mm -hmm. not a full screen. It's actually okay, just in case you want to share the full screen. But I, I think uh, I think it's not really important. no. We, we, we will arrange it for the full screen. But what you see now is not the full screen. Right, it's not. But it's okay. Uh, so just a second. Uh, so this, this polygon is a PowerPoint slideshow. No, it's not PowerPoint slideshow. This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, How is it now? Perfect. Yes. Ah, uh, good. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Ah, no, I tell you what I know. Some a little bit. My, my height and yours, but then. Just one to you right now to switch slides.
So, Andy and Tevi, shall we about to start? Yeah, whenever you, okay. you feel like. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, welcome everyone and introduce you too. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to Harvard University Quantum Matter in Math and Physics seminar series at the CMSA. It's also a joint seminar uh, today with Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And today we are very honored to welcome Professor Eddie Sturm and Professor David Morris from uh, Weizmann. Uh, professor Eddie Sturm is a, a, a well-known professor working on a wide range of topics in strong correlative electronic system, especially the fractional quantum hole systems. And Professor David Morris uh, graduate uh, is uh, is actually was my previous uh, colleague at MIT. He graduated from MIT under the super supervision of a uh, central Todadri at MIT, and then he went to uh, Caltech for postdoc. Currently, uh, uh, start his faculty position a few years back. And today, it's our honor to uh, have them to uh, tell us some exciting stories that uh, they kept de developing on this new equal to five hub professional quantum hole systems, and they will tell us the insights, recent insights from theory and experiments. So uh, let's welcome uh, them. And also because it's for uh, Israel audience, I should say uh, thank you very much. And it's our honor to have them. And please feel home. So welcome. Please. Thank you very much, Joven. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, as, as you understand, uh, David and I are in the same office or, or the same uh, uh, meeting room. Uh, you are, I believe, seeing now only me, but uh, uh, we will both be listening uh, and participating all along. Um, and I'd like to say uh, thanks a lot for, for this invitation. Uh, uh, in the previous occasions, I had to speak at Harvard. Uh, you know, uh, there was also a, a stall along the Charles River involved, and the, uh, various other uh, uh, joys. And I hope uh, next time we'll involve those as well. Um, so, so uh, our plan uh, for the talk is this: uh, um, first, we will start with a review of the physics of the nucleus, the five half fractional quantum wall state. Uh, very quickly, what's the quantum Hall effect? Um, in particular, the five half state, what's the composite Fermion picture, which we will use a lot. Um, what's a, a class D superconductivity, which will turn out to be very important here. What are the candidate states of the uh, five half state and, and the uh, edge structure of each candidate state? Second uh, part, we'll, we'll talk about uh, numerics and experiments. There will be first part about numerics, then experiment, then second part about numerics. And, th and then we'll go to three pieces of work, which are the main part of, the, of, the, of today's seminar. Uh, uh, one will be on uh, uh, the particle all Fafian phase coming out of a mixture of the Fafian and anti-Fafian uh, puddles. Now, uh, I don't see you, you know, that, that's part of uh, uh, the reality of life of the Zoom era. 
So, so I have no way to know whether you know, uh, whether you, you actually invented the Fafian, anti-Fafian, pH Fafian phases, or, or whether you hear about them first time. Uh, so I'll just say, for those of you who hear about it first time, everything will be introduced. Uh, so you don't need to know anything. Uh, so, so we'll talk about that. Uh, this is based on a piece of work uh, David and I uh, were involved in together with our colleagues and, and, and friends, Yuval Ure, Gilad Margalit, and Moti Eiblu. Um, then, then we'll talk about what happens at high temperature. And, and uh, for once, a high temperature will actually have a friendly effect. And that will uh, summarize the work. Um, again, David and I were, were involved in with a, a, a Cosmo Fulga, Yuval Ure, and Sasha Melin. And, and last will be uh, about uh, uh, identifying topological order with the uh, mesoscopic electric measurements. Uh, the, the previous two will involve thermal measurements. Uh, and that's a, a, a very recent work with uh, uh, David and his student, uh, Misha. Uh, so this is uh, the planner. You see that there's a color code. Uh, it doesn't uh, refer to Democrats and Republicans. It refers to uh, my part and David's part, uh, where, where I take the, the dark blue. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the whole effect, you have a two-dimensional system, uh, a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane, a uh, current is flowing from left to right, a uh, whole voltage uh, uh, develops perpendicular to the current because of the Lorentz force that bends the trajectories of the electrons. The resistivity becomes a matrix uh, with a longitudinal part and the whole part. And a classical, you know, common sense, simple common sense uh, theory tells you that uh, all resistivity or XY is proportional to the magnetic field because the whole voltage uh, is supposed to cancel the Lorentz force and the Lorentz force is proportional to the magnetic field and the longitudinal resistivity is unchanged by the magnetic field. This is really simple-minded uh, and, and, and totally classical. Quantum mechanically, two things, uh, many things happen, but two which I want to mention on this slide uh, is, is first of all, the introduction of lambda levels, you know, with the uh, thermodynamic degeneracy uh, and uh, with a uh, harmonic oscillator uh, um, spectrum in, in uh, the case that we mostly talk about of quadratic uh, dispersion of electrons. Uh, so that's one thing, lambda level, and the other thing is, uh, uh, the lambda level filling factor, which is this uh, magic number nu, which is the ratio of the density of electrons to the density of flux quanta. The flux quantum is Hc over E. Now you can write the classical expectation for the whole resistivity in terms of this number nu, and, and you find that OXY is H over E squared times nu, and nu is, some number, is a number uh, uh, defined here that's inversely proportional to the magnetic field, and it is a real continuous number. Now, uh, as you find out, as the experiment tells you, not all news are born equal. And when you look at the uh, whole resistivity, this black line here, as a function of magnetic field, you find that instead of being uh, uh, um, proportional to one of a new or proportional to the magnetic field, the system gets stuck on particular values of, uh, uh, of new. Uh, and, and at those values, the uh, whole resistivity does not change as you change the magnetic field. And the longitudinal resistivity at the same values uh, vanishes. So uh, there is no dissipation in the flow of the current. Now, um, that's the quantum Hall effect. And that uh, defines to us this uh, exclusive class of uh, of a special news. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that uh, there are two types of them. New can be an integer, and, and you know it goes one, two, three, four, up to some two digit in integer. And there are also about 30, 40, uh, some number of this range of uh, fractional values, P over Q, all rational. Uh, P over Q, Q is usually odd. Uh, the term usually is not really well defined, but there are exceptions. And in fact, our focus today, as you know, is one of these exceptions, uh, five halves. Uh, so so, so uh, this is the quantum Hall effect. Uh, I'll say very quickly that the five halves, of course, is between two and four, uh, as you know. And uh, it turns out that at Lando levels between two and four, 
many interesting things happen, not just five halves, uh, but uh, you know, even the nominator uh, fractions are, are observed, like five halves, seven halves, and 19 over eight. Uh, the, the series that is observed does not follow the same rule that you see between zero and two, which is uh, this P over two P plus one. Uh, and also the works why as you change the magnetic field, not only that it doesn't go linear as classical physics tells you to expect, but it, it is even not monotonic. Uh, and, and, and you see that uh, uh, at high temperatures, it is even when it has these steps, works why is monotonic in magnetic field, uh, at low temperatures between two and four, it, it becomes even non-monotonic. Those are all, all these are very interesting uh, uh, aspects out of which we will focus only on one, on the new equals uh, five halves. So new equals five halves is a fractional quantum whole state like all others, which means that there are several characteristics that it must uh, share because all fractional quantum whole states share them. Uh, so, so first, the bulk of the state is gapped. This is why you don't have any dissipation when current is flowing. The edge is gapless because if it wasn't gapless, where would the current flow? Uh, and because, so those two aspects are just a, a more or less defining aspects of the quantum Hall effect integer or fractional. Um, but now two, which are a characteristic of fractional states, the state carries a, a quasi particles whose charge is a fraction of the electron charge. And when you put the, that state on a toes, which is very easy to do if you're a theorist, uh, you put it on a toes, you find that the system is fully gapped because there are no edges, and you find that the ground state is topologically degenerate. Those are characteristics which are common to all fractional quantum world states. We would like to understand a few things which are unique to the five half state. Um, First of all, we'd like to know to, to understand all the defining topological quantum numbers of that particular state, because you know we want we're ambitious. Uh, second, it would be nice and completely relevant to this talk to know also some non-topological information. Uh, for example, the energy gap, uh, how to calculate, but interesting. But above all, what we'd like to know is whether the five-half state is a billion or non-abelian. And I'll uh, now uh, review for you uh, what's a billion and non abelian. But before doing that, I'll uh, uh, dwell for a, a minute, um, uh, uh, for, for, for a fraction of a minute, uh, about the, this concept of ground state degeneracy. What do we mean when we say that the system, wherever, on a toes or not on a toes, uh, has a ground state degeneracy? What do we mean is the following. We mean that if we take the system and diagonalize it, but for somehow uh, fully diagonalize the system, uh, there will be several ground states, all of which are uh, degenerate. So we can call the energy zero. And then there will be a, a, a diagonalized it. So it, it's a diagonal matrix. Uh, at least I diagonalized it in my dream. Uh, and, and there will be excited states, all of them are gapped. So, and they would have a continuous, a continuum of energies and there will be an energy gap. Now, that's, that's what we mean when we say there's a degeneracy of the ground state. But the crucial point here is if we introduce a perturbation uh, to the Hamiltonian and re-diagonalize it, we will find that there will generally, at least in the thermodynamic limit and so on, there will be no matrix elements introduced in this subspace, uh, which means uh, that the only matrix element that will be introduced will be here and here and here. And if you take their effect into account uh, and re-diagonalize, you will find that uh, this degeneracy, the ground state, the energy of the ground state may have shifted, but it shifted more or less the same to all ground states. So you did not split the degeneracy. Uh, maybe up to uh, terms which are exponential in the size of the system. Exponentially small, I mean, in the size of the system. So this is the notion of ground state degeneracy, and this is something that holds for all fractional quantum whole states. But there's a difference, in the, a very crucial difference, uh, um, here between a billion and non-abelian states. So for abelian states, 
the ground state is degenerate only when you put the system on a toes. For a non-abelian state, the ground state is degenerate uh, uh, even if the system is on a plane, uh, provided that the bulk of the system carries quasi particles. And that is, uh, that's the major difference between the, the two and that's something I'll explain now. Uh, I should say by passing, but it will, it's, you know, like a gun uh, sitting on, on the table in the first act of the play, it will shoot later on. Uh, there's another difference, important difference between the edges of the uh, abelian and non-abelian states. Uh, for abelian states, the, the edge states uh, are, are, are one dimensional uh, systems characterized by uh, an integer central charge, and while the non abelian ones have a neutral modes which have fractional central charge. And we'll get back to that later on. Uh, so, so uh, 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 back to, to this notion of ground state degeneracy. Uh, for non abelian states, as I said, there is a degeneracy. Uh, that comes out of the presence of quasi particle in quasi particles in the bulk of the system. So here, for example, you you see my drawing with four quasi particles, and there's a certain degeneracy of the ground state. It goes like two to the power of half the number of quasi particles. Actually, minus one. Never mind. Uh, it it goes expo it goes exponentially with the number of quasi particles in the bulk, and uh, then there's a, a subspace of degenerate ground states. Now, if you take um, two quasi particles, as the picture shows, if you take two quasi particles and interchange their positions, and you do it adiabatically because of the energy gap, the system stays in a ground state all along, but not necessarily the ground state you started from. And if you finish the, this uh, manipulation, having the quasi particles at the same place as they occupied before, you may find yourself in a different uh, uh, ground state. Uh, uh, to make it slightly more formal, uh, those are the, the, the uh, ground states. Each one of them is a function of the parameters, which are the positions of the quasi particles. And if you interchange two of those positions, you get a unitary transformation that acts within this subspace of ground states. Now, if you do several interchanges in series, uh, you will get several unitary transformations, which are unitary matrices, whose uh, uh, multiplication is non-abelian, and, and this is why the name non-abelian states. Uh, now, the unitary, those unitary transformations actually uh, very beautifully depend only on the uh, topology of the trajectory that uh, the, the, the quasi-particles uh, take, uh, not on the dynamics of the trajectory, not, uh, don't even think about that, but even not on the geometry, only on the topology. Uh, and and, and that, uh, uh, that's a very unique aspect and that uh, what brought uh, Alexei Kitaev some years ago uh, to, to think about using uh, this subspace, excuse me, subspace of ground states uh, uh, for uh, carrying out quantum computation using the, the immunity to errors that comes out of the fact that if you do the interchange like that, or, or, or you do it in a less stable way, uh, um, carrying out a slightly different trajectory, the outcome, the, 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 the unit of transformation that you will implement will be the same. Uh, so, so, so that quick review of the nucleus five of state was supposed to convince you that uh, uh, listening to it, to uh, its story and thinking about it is worth your time. Uh, if I didn't do that, stop me and uh, uh, ask questions, uh, uh, or stop me in any case if you want. Uh, again, I, as I said before, I don't see it. Now, um, that was uh, the story of non-abelian quantum all states in general. The number one candidate of, uh, of all the fractions we talked about before, the number one candidate for uh, being a, 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 non, a non abelian is the nucleus five halves. And this is the more weird observation from some, some years ago. Uh, so, so, so let's now focus on the five half state. Uh, so, so 
what we'd like is to derive a picture that will convince us that it is a, a, a valid possibility that a, a nuclear fiber office is, is actually non-abelian. And that uh, picture has three steps in it. The first step is the numerical identity, which was uh, proven by supercomputers, which is that five halves is two plus one half, uh, which allows us to think about this system as two field Lando levels, which we forget about, plus one plus a half field Lando level. I should say, uh, more or less the same time, it was also proven that five halves is three minus one half. Uh, actually, it was proven later. Uh, but but uh, that tells us that we can also think about this state as three full Lando levels plus one half Lando levels of holes. Uh, and, and David will talk about something like that uh, later on. Uh, so this was step number one. Now we, we are left with 20% uh, of the electrons, only the half field Lando level to worry about. The second step in our analysis is what's known as the Chen Simons transformation or composite fermion transformation. And this is a transformation that takes us from the, this problem that we're interested in of electrons at the half field Lando level to the problems of uh, composite fermions. What's important that they are fermions at a zero average magnetic field. Uh, and that is a result of many, many works, uh, mostly of the 80s, 90s. I'll, do, I'll uh, summarize this very, very quickly for you. Uh, our problem is electrons in a magnetic field, uh, two-dimensional electrons in a magnetic field uh, that satisfy a shedding equation. Uh, what we do is we uh, redefine a, a, a wave function instead of psi, which is what uh, the which is the wave function of the electrons. We redefine a new wave function and substitute this into Schrodinger's equation. Uh, and the new wave, uh, wave function, the old wave function are related by a phase factor. Uh, the phase factor is even to the interchange of any two electrons, which means that the statistics of this wave function and the statistics of this wave function. I hope that you are seeing uh, my, my uh, pointing. I'll do it better now. Oh. Yes. OK, yes. good. Uh, so, so, so. Uh, uh, the, the, the symmetry properties of the old wave function, which is fermionic, and the new wave function will be the same. So this, this justifies the name composite fermions. Uh, and uh, uh, now after substituting, we find that this wave function satisfies the Schrodinger equation also, but with a different Hamiltonian. And the difference between the original Hamiltonian and the final Hamiltonian is that this transformation uh, attached two flux quanta on the back of each electron. So now each electron carries not only a charge, uh, uh, you know, minus E, uh, but also two uh, uh, flux, quanta, uh, uh, flux quanta of magnetic field. Uh, now that just made the problem harder because now the electrons interact with one another, not just by the Coulomb interaction, but also by, by uh, a magnetic interaction, each one seeing the vector potential generated by the uh, uh, flux tubes on the other's uh, back. But uh, it uh, opens the way uh, for uh, an approximation, a mean field approximation, in which the uh, magnetic field we attach to the electrons is spread uniformly over the entire plane. That means that we met the problem under this very uh, bold approximation, mean field approximation, we map the problem from electrons uh, at nu equals one half to composite fermions at zero magnetic field, which brings us to uh, the third uh, step, uh, which is the observation that fermions at zero magnetic field can form a superconductors, a, a two dimensional superconductor. Now there is no real time reversal symmetry in this problem. Uh, so, so, so we are talking about two dimensional superconductors which do not have a, a time reversal symmetry. That's what's known as class D in the Cartana uh, Adlan Zinbauer uh, classification, uh, class D and a two dimensional superconductor with no uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, 
have a topological classification of the integer number z. Uh, and the integer index counts how many chiron majorana modes you have going around the, 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 the plane, uh, where, of course, a, a, a you know, positive number goes clockwise and negative number goes anti-clockwise, or maybe the other way around. Uh, what's important is not the sign, is the parity. Because if you have an odd number of chiral marijuana modes, that uh, implies that vortices in the bulk of that superconductor must carry zero modes. Uh, that comes out of uh, the requirement that the number of zero modes in the entire Hamiltonian must be an even number. Each uh, chiral marijuana mode may carry one uh, uh, zero mode, and therefore if there's an odd number of, of uh, uh, chiral modes, there must be a zero mode at uh, the, the, the center of each vortex. And this marijuana zero mode, which you probably have heard all, all about also in the context of superconductors of electrons, not superconductors of composite fermions, uh, this uh, marijuana zero modes are what uh, gives rise to the uh, uh, ground st state degeneracy that's exponential in the number of uh, vortices. Uh, so, so, as we said, the, there's a, a, a Z classification, an integer number classification that lead, uh, uh, introduces to us an infinite number of candidate states uh, for, for the new equals five half state. It, uh, we have an infinite, infinitely many possibilities for a, 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 a infinitely many possibilities for, for class D superconductors of composite fermions, which would describe the new equals five half state. Uh, so infinitely many, and we have an hour and a half that, uh, uh, that is uh, challenging. Uh, in fact, we will focus only on five of them, uh, and, and they will, uh, uh, you see the number of, uh, um, uh, of uh, chiral modes going uh, one, zero, minus one, minus two, minus three, and a, they are named in a systematic manner. Uh, the one is called Fafian, the zero is called K equals eight, the minus one is called PH Fafian, the minus two is called one, one, three, and the minus three is called anti-Fafian. I could go on also to the other two sides and the scheme would become even more systematic. Uh, so, so uh, uh, but, but we don't need that, we need only those. Uh, and the reason why we need only those will become clear uh, when David takes over. Uh, I'll just say that on top of those marijuana modes that comes out of the system being a class D superconductor of, of composite fermions, there are also charge mode, first of all, uh, those two charge mode of the lower two, lower innocent two full lambda levels, which are not involved in all this business. Uh, and also a charge mode of the half field lambda level, which carries the sigma xy of one half. Uh, so so uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, um, that's the new equals five half state. Now we'd like to be able to identify the uh, topological order and just say, uh, there, there are lots uh, of ideas over the years. Uh, in particular, in red here, I, I wrote uh, the, the brave experimentalists who, who attempted to se uh, search for these experimentally proposed signatures, the uh, Willett and collaborators and Radwin collaborators looked at interference and tunneling. And, and there are various others, uh, uh, probes that are mentioned, that were mentioned. This list is all, uh, has all, all one uh, common feature, which is those are things we will not talk about. Uh, we will talk about numerical studies, about thermal oil measurements, and about mesoscopic electrical measurements. And uh, with this, uh, to, to fulfill this promise, I turn you to, to David. How do I take over here? Uh, yeah, I just want to share different screen, but I don't know how to find it here. Because you have too many windows open. <laughs> I 
can find my part two, I cannot find my part one. Mm -hmm. See it here? Should be here. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. This one. And I'll start sharing here. Okay. I don't want to go I need to move the yeah. Share screen. Share. Is it sharing it? It's yeah, good. it's sharing it. Oh, okay. Uh, but not on the not on the full screen mode. Not in. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know how to change it from here because I have. Um... Okay, here we go. You full screen. Yeah. Now it's working. Maybe. No. It's, uh... Okay, great. Yeah, sorry for the um for the technical difficulties. Yeah, so um, I also want to thank um, Kevin for inviting us to talk here. And I want to continue and pick up with what the, the question is what we might call the New Equals 5 half Enigma, which is what is the topological order that is realized in this filling factor? So it has first been measured that there is a plateau at 5 half more than 30 years ago. And despite that, I don't think we can say with any amount of confidence uh, what phase is actually realized um, at this filling factor. So. Um, I'll change the notation a little bit just because I'm going to be drawing many edges to make it a little bit more, um, more, more concise. All right. And I want to talk about what can numerics tell us um, uh, about the state. So we have in the last couple of years learned a lot about this, this state, or we think we have learned a lot about this plateau from experiment, but I want just to go back a couple of years and to see you know, where did we stand a couple of years ago with regard to what the phase is. And I think at that point, uh, the, our best information came probably from numerics and specifically numerics in the quantum hall context um, mostly refers to exact diagonalization. So there we take our, our single particle states, which I've noted here, just by particles in the Landau levels. And we restrict ourselves to the one where all the action is, which is the one which is partially filled. And in the basic, basic way, we just throw away all the empty ones and we throw away um, all the full ones. And at the filling factor one half, there's something very special happening, which, um, which Adi already alluded to, which is we can view it as either half a Lando level of electrons or um, half a Lando level of false holes. And this kind of, um, this particle hole symmetry that's inherent to this five uh, half state is kind of important. So let me go, um, go into this and explain uh, some parts about it. So there is this notion of a particle hole transformation, and we went to, may want to know what happens to a given phase that may be realized under such a particle hole transformation. So if my electrons form a certain phase characterized by some integer, you know, what phase do my, um, do my holes form? Because that will be certainly important for numerical experiments which have this particle hole symmetry built in, we will not be able to distinguish those two types of states. So the basic state with some integer here is uh, denoted here. So we have a filling factor two and the filling factor five half. So we have no integers in the game. There's a fractional charge mode and some number of bio runners. And now I just want to apply this particle hole transformation everywhere. So this particle hole transformation maps the filled Landau level to an empty Landau level. So it maps nu equals two to two nu equals three. It keeps nu equals five half the same and it's going to do something to um, this integer n and we don't yet know what it is and we want to find out. But the edge can't really change under this transformation. We just make a global discrete transformation. So the structure of the edge must, must remain the same. It will still have some charge mode moving in some way and it'll have the same number of myronas moving at the edge. So in this case, this number of myronas at the edge between five, half and three is no longer be, uh, is no longer identical to the integer um, n prime that characterizes the phase. And so to find it out, a convenient way is to you know, study a slightly different system where I'm putting a small strip of filling factor two between the five half and the three. Because then I already know what all the edges look like. I know that between two and three, I have a single integer, integer mode. 
noted here by the uh, by the arrow with right hand side, and I know that it's the interface between new equals two and a new plus five half state with uh, n prime. I'm having n prime my runners. Now the crucial thing that you'll see time and again here is a change of basis noted uh, like below. If I have a left moving electron and a right moving fractional charge mode, I can formally replace it. That's just a change of basis to a left moving fractional charge mode and a right moving neutral fermion or equivalently two right moving uh, Majorana fermions. So you can think of this, um, of this change of basis with the bulk excitations. If I uh, take my charge one half semions, which um, these quantum all states um, all host and combine them with an electron, I can form a new type of charge one half semion. That's precisely the relation from the fractional modes. And similarly, I can create a neutral fermion by combining uh, two semions uh, with an electron. So that's the bulk interpretation of the change of basis, or more formally, um, it's some SL2C transformation on the, on the K matrix that characterizes the abelian sector of my theory. But regardless, it's a change of basis, which I'm always free to do. So let me do it. So after this change of basis, you now see that I have again a single fractional charge mode and the number of my runners um, from which I have the original uh, and, uh, and, my run and prime my runners and I have two additional ones from this transformation. So um, it follows, since they must be the same as the original n, that under this particle transformation, my integer n changes to minus n minus two. And that's just um, as well as it comes out. And from the point of view of the states, which I, I already mentioned, it maps the Pfaffian onto the anti pfaffian state. That's essentially where the name is coming from. And that already um, motivates the kind of states that um, Adi was presenting you, namely is are those that are centered around the particle hole symmetric value, which is n equals minus one half. Okay, I can actually, I cannot really see my own slides, which makes it a little bit tricky to, um, to see what I'm talking about. Okay, well, my best. Okay, so now we can uh, come to, to numerics. So the, the first generation of uh, numerical experiments on this kind of state used Hamiltonians, uh, which had this particle hole symmetry built in. So as a matter of principle, they, you know, if they tell you that Pfaffian is good, then they also tell you that anti pfaffian is good. And that's indeed what they find. So all these um, numerical works consistently find that um, Pfaffian and um, thus also the anti pfaffian are kind of likely ground states of um, Coulomb interactions or Coulomb plus, you know, plus more modifications in, the, in this um, nucleus five half filling factor. Now, um, more recently, uh, what I would call a second generation of numerical experiments encoded mixing between different Landau levels, uh, which will lift this particle symmetry and thereby lift the degeneracy between these two phases. Now you can you know, break the symmetry in different ways and depending on how you do it, um, you, know, you may get either the Pfaffian or the anti pfaffian Like the general consensus that it must be one of the two hasn't really been changed. And I think there's somewhat of an emerging consensus that anti pfaffian at least from the numerical perspective, is more likely um, than the Pfaffian. That's um, what numerics can tell us. So now I'm going to turn to um, experiments that have been done recent, recently, um, yeah, all at the, at the Weizmann group. And the first one is a thermal transport measurement at the 5 half state, which was done a few years back. So that's uh, uh, the device as it's, as it's presented in this work. So let me simplify it a little bit to focus on what's important here. We have these four arms, which are all in this uh, five half plateau. And in the middle, we have this uh, shown in gold, it's some metallic island. And what's done in the experiment is some current is driven from down here with a one labeled um, I in, and it enters this, this uh, metallic island, and then it can leave again, and it can leave at uh, one of those four arms, I1, I2, I3, I4. And of course, charge is conserved, so whatever comes in must also go out. But as the current enters this metallic island and leaves it again, uh, there may be dissipation and it may in fact heat up this island. And one can just compute it by pair elementary ways what's going to happen. It's governed by the Joule's law. And the power balance is just uh, whatever again comes in minus whatever comes out. So since all this is known, we know what the conductances are. We know what, what the currents are because that's what the expansion controls. This, this delta P, that's a known number. Right? That's a number known from the experiment. But then once, uh, once this small contact, this floating contact in the middle heats up, the heat will eventually flow out of it in some way. 
if there's some thermal conductance, be it to the environment, to phonons, which is as important as low energies, or uh, along the same kind of um, fractional edge states. So at low energies, the heat flow out of this contact is governed by the edge states and um, uh, given by this formula down, down here. So it's um, determined by some, some number k, which you want to measure, n, just the number of arms, phi, uh, four in my picture, and the temperature, that's a quantity that's measured in, in some you know, complicated way using noise, which is not so important. Here. The important thing is we measure the temperature is being measured. And from that, since everything else is known, one can uh, infer the thermal conductance from the central island to the outside. So it's like a two terminal measurement. And this is what, uh, what the experiment finds. So indeed, uh, delta P is plotted as a function of the temperature and it follows this quadratic behavior. And by fitting, fitting it for different uh, numbers of this integer n, uh, one can see that K is essentially uh, five halves up to some small corrections. And here there is an, an overview of this, of this number K that's being extracted over here, all in units of the thermal conductance quantum, which is this number. Because that's what the experiment tells. It tells us that this there's this number, the number k, and this number is five half. So what does this number mean? So for that, it's, it's sufficient to look just at a single um, uh, single branch of this device. So we have one hot side, one cold side, and we can ask how does um, how is the heat transported from the one side to the other side? Uh, so, so you know, the, the simplest scenario is that all the heat is transported along the top edge where all the modes are going from the hot to the cold. And then one can determine this conductance just by, you know, by simple um, algebra, just adding as numbers, each charge carrying mode, which means each electron mode or each fractional mode contributes an integer one. So we get one, two, three, just from those modes. And then each Majorana contributes one half. So this number determines uh, what would be the, the thermal conductance if it all flows in this way. Now it's of course possible that this number n is negative and therefore um, the Majoranas that go from hot to cold would sit uh, at the lower edge. And it's conceivable in principle that also those may carry, uh, carry the heat. So in that, ca that case, the, conductance, the thermal conductance would be again obtained by summing precisely the same, the same integers just as an absolute value. But this assumes that really all these modes as they go from the left to the right don't actually interact with each other and don't equilibrate. Now, if they do, then the heat can be kind of shared between all these modes. And then it's just a question of does more, more modes flow from left to right and from right to left, and they'll all be at a, at a common temperature, they'll all be warm or they'll all be cold. And in that case, the thermal conductance is given just by the, by the net thermal conductance of the edge that has more modes flowing from left to right. So it's the absolute value of uh, all the integers um, and whatever the Majoranas might contribute. And so these, these are the, the, the two cases. And now remember that um, the two states which, which you may be interested in, there's the anti paffian there's the Pafian. Uh, we know what, what n is, n is one and minus three. And so the values are seven half. For the Pafian, the bare one and the equilibrated one are the same. For the anti fafian we have two different values. And for the pH fafian um, we have, you know, again, different values like so. And the, 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 the number measured in the experiment is directly consistent with the fully equilibrated value for the pH fafian It's completely inconsistent with the fafian so that can be ruled out reasonably safely. But uh, for the anti fafian there still may be a bit of a wiggle room because you have you know, the bare value, which is larger than what's measured. You have the equilibrated ones which is lower than what's measured. So we may imagine that there are some, some partial equilibration or something going on that uh, may allow the anti fafian to be compatible with the experiment. But of course that requires some extra assumption why the equilibration will happen in this, um, in this precise way. That's what, what these works were about. Right? So yeah, the basic upshot of this first experiment is that what the, the fafian is ruled out with uh, reasonable confidence. The anti fafian is suggested, as a pH fafian is suggested, and the anti fafian well, it, you know, it requires some, some work in order to survive. Now, I'm moving on to a second experiment, which was just um, appearing on the archive earlier this year. And here's uh, the main student involved for the BIVAS, um, uh, this picture down there. And that's about upstream noise. So in this case, so if you have a device shown over here, the five half state, again, bounding the nucleus uh, two, 
And there's a current that's flowing downstream from the source to the drain is indicated by the arrow. Now, the, the question is just a simple binary question, which is as the current is flowing, is there any noise measured uh, in the upstream direction? So the current flows from left to right, uh, but is there any noise appearing even further to the left? And because if there's such noise and it cannot be carried by, by the charge modes because they go in the wrong direction, so there must be some mode going the other way. So that can tell you something about um, what is integer is. And crucially, it's not only measured in this configuration of phi half compared to two, but also phi half compared to three, where we get a different integer, which is uh, precisely this minus n minus two, which I was um, describing before. So just to, to show you how this goes, let me first go to a simpler case where we don't have any mode going upstream. It's uh, uh, the filling factor two plus one third. So it's a Laughlin state on top of two field Landau levels. There's only a single mode. It goes from source to drain. And uh, at the upstream amplifier, there's just no noise. There's just nothing. By contrast, if you take the same state at the interface at neutral three, now you do have counterpropagating mode. There's one charge mode in a neutral mode. And as expected, um, there is noise measured uh, in the upstream amplifier. So that, that, this is kind of the picture that you expect to see. The left one tells you there's no neutral mode going upstream. And the right picture tells you there is a neutral uh, noise in the upstream direction. Debbie. Yes. Remind me, what's A, S, and D? Is there something? A is, a is the amplifier, S is the source, and D is the drain. Okay. But the current always flows from source to drain, and then you ask what uh, what do you measure in the amplifier? So that's A. Right, so, that's, so this is what what we had in this case. But you can also look at uh, at the two third state. Right again, two phase level levels plus a two third state, which is just a particle hole conjugate version uh, of the one third state, and uh, Again, as expected, where the picture changes uh, and get precisely the opposite, you measure uh, upstream noise in the first interface with mu plus two, but you don't measure any, any noise in the interface with mu plus three. And so this is kind of to tell you that this, this measurement just works. It really tells you, do I have the upstream uh, neutral mode or do I have, do I don't have, have it? So now we're going to the five half case. And firstly, uh, the interface of five half um, with two, so there should be n downstream my runners. And he measures upstream noise, right? He measures upstream noise means there must be some mode going, going towards the left, which means the integer n must be negative. Now, in the opposite configuration, the number of downstream modes is minus n, uh, is minus, n minus two. And again, there's upstream noise, which tells us that also this number must be negative or n plus two must be positive. And if I were trying to satisfy an integer that satisfies the two requirements, there's just a single one, which is n minus one, and that's the value for um, for the pH function. So this is kind of a summary of all these thermal transport experiments. Firstly, there's the the, the straightforward thermal transport I described in some detail, which uh, finds evidence of the pH function state. Uh, there's this um, upstream noise measurement, and it also supports the pH function state. And finally, there's a not yet published experiment, but which I'm allowed to share where the first experiment is essentially repeated on a background of mu equals three. Like that essentially, again, flips what's uh, particle-like and what whole-like. And while the previous experiment allowed us to rule out the Pafian with some confidence, this one uh, allows us to rule out the anti pafian with some confidence. And you can see that here the value is, and you can see it's plotted over here again, delta P against this number T in squared, and the slope is, is one half. Again, the value for, um, for pH Fafian. And in this case, there's no issue about the anti Fafian equilibration. And it seems like it would also rule out uh, the anti Fafian state. And so, so all these all these experiments without, you know, they, they kind of very consistently uh, find um, results compatible with the pH Fafian state and not with any of the other possible candidates. So that makes one wonder a little bit what, what's wrong with pH Fafian that numerics doesn't like it. Right. Firstly, we, uh, you know, I mentioned that reasonable Hamiltonians, you know, Hamiltonians based on interactions which, uh, which believe are likely, don't find this phase. Uh, but it's even more kind of more strikingly that even if you forget about the requirement of being reasonable, take any you know isotropic Hamiltonian, if you try to uh, you know mess with your parameters in order to find it, okay, you, you have probably haven't tried everything, but people have looked for it and they could never find such a pH fucking ground state. 
uh, in such an isotropic model. They are kind of coupled wire models where you can have such a ground state, but they are um, you know, very different and probably not what most people would deem, um, deem realistic. But there's one more uh, theoretical weapon that we have uh, in our arsenal in quantum Hall states, and that's one of trial wave functions. Right. Trial wave functions are really kind of teach us a lot about the quantum Hall state. And one of the most famous ones is the Mourid wave function written down here, just a Pafian of these different coordinates times some um, some simple just factor. And by analogy, uh, one may imagine uh, that the trial wave function for the pH Pafian state is exactly the same, just that the Pafian gets a particular conjugation corresponding to reverse direction of the Majorana modes. So one kind of caveat about this is in order to study such a state, one actually needs to perform an explicit projection to the Landau level. Right? So the Moritz state is in the lowest Landau level, the pH function is not. So one needs to do that, and that turns out to be quite hard. So it's um, only doable to relatively small system sizes. As you can see, most of the works have been like, you know, on the order of 10 particles, uh, where you can maybe not learn all that you want to know. Uh, but we managed to push it, or oh, my student rather managed to push it to a little bit higher numbers, like 56 particles. And there you may actually actually be able to see, you know, is this um, a sensible state? Is it well behaved? Or is there something wrong with such a trial state? And here's what he finds. Firstly, if you don't use projection, everything looks nice. So here's the density density correlation function. At short distances, uh, you know, particles repel each other. There's some peak at the interparticle spacing. And then eventually the correlations just decay to the average particle number. And you can try to fit the, you know, this, this, uh, the height of the small oscillations and they uh, decay perfectly exponentially, as you expect for a gap space. If, if, if this wave function describes um, you know, a gap ground state, then you expect all correlation lengths to be finite and everything to decay exponentially. But once we do the projection, uh, things go wrong. So we can see that now we no longer have this nice exponential decay. Instead, the correlation functions keep oscillating, and then there's no indication that these uh, oscillations ever decay um, with distance. I mean, at larger systems, they, they even increase. And they don't look anything like an exponential decay. In fact, it's even difficult to, you know, to know exactly uh, what the amplitude is because the baseline kind of shifts. It's really behaving nothing at all like a gap state. So there seems, seems to be something more fundamentally wrong about this, this, this pH function state rather than just our, our lack of imagination in writing down a good Hamiltonian that would have as a ground state. So there's, um, you know, things, there's a lot of you know, numerical reasons why pH function um, is just uh, disfavored. And that makes it maybe so exciting that all the experiments point in favor of pH function, but all, all the numerics kind of um, are against it. And so it's uh, still unclear how causes will be resolved. So there's been some suggestions that there's um, some fundamental reason that this pH factor in the phase may be incompatible with certain symmetries um, that you may care about, such as particle hole symmetry or translations and so on. But, but now I'm going to um, turn uh, again over to, to Adi and he'll again instead talk about how the pH factor in phase may arise in a system uh, where the translation symmetry is broken by random impurities. Excuse me, David. Yes. Yes. Uh, just make sure. So, what's the uh, key message that we, we should take about the numerics you have done on the trial wave function of the pH Fabian? Uh, the, the key message is we don't know a trial wave function of the pH function. I'm claiming that the, tri the, the naive trial wave function that most people would have written down uh, appears once you project it to describe a critical state. So, we don't have a good trial wave function. And you know, if we had a good trial wave function, we might be able to use it in order to find a Hamiltonian or something like that. But then, but then it seems to be more, you know, something more fundamentally wrong with this. You know, may, just this process of projecting to the lowest Landau level seems to, um, you know, destabilize the pH function. Right. So let me just make sure. Just make me and other audience and I get confused. I think pH function by its own of some topological order is still well defined. But just the trial wave function, people write it down that uh, may not be an ideal or realistic or not even physical sensible wave function. No, I think it's a perfectly sensible wave function. It's just not a wave function that describes um, a gap state. And since the pH function is a gap state, that then the wave function that we would write down does not describe the pH function. So P there, yeah, there certainly will be wave function for the pH function. Certainly, if you do not require projection into a given Landau level, but 
once you do require the projection, which we normally like to do in the quantum hall context, then the wave function, which, you know, which most people would have written down based on, you know, 20 years of quantum hall experience just fails. It does not describe the phase that we would like to describe. And at this point, we have no, I think we don't have a Hamiltonian for this phase. In the lowest standard level, and we do not have a wave function. For this that, that's the main message. Right, right. I, I agree with you. But let me just just make sure first, uh, pH Fabian should still be some well-defined order by its own without mentioning Hamiltonian or maybe wave function, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we we may have, we may have a continuum field theory description. That's one thing. And second is that uh, uh, may I is is my interpretation correct? Suppose people try to identify whether these they are pH Fabian. Do they try to uh, solve the ground state a wave function of some Hamiltonian and then try to overlap or project to the trial wave function of pH Fabian? And that, that the, then if that, that's the case, people have done as a procedure to check, then there's a, a loophole because, because that pH Fabian trial wave function may not be may not be a good one we should look at. Is that the- I, I agree with you. I agree with you that you can only compute you know, tends to be the overlap of your ground of your numerical ground state with the trial state if you have a good trial state and we don't have a good trial state. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. I think uh, no problem. Yeah, thanks. So I'll uh, take over with the hope of uh, finding uh, how exactly to do it. Um, and I should also mention the audience should feel free to ask question if they find appropriate time to ask. And, and uh, the speakers, the audience, David, don't worry about go over time. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a very dangerous thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, thank you. Um, so so, so uh, you know, the, 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 the bottom line of what uh, uh, of, of all these developments of uh, um, the experiments in the last few years is there were two candidates of, uh, you know, two parties and suddenly a third party candidate came up and emerged as a very realistic one, which is the, the particle hole schematic Fafian. And uh, uh, together with uh, uh, some uh, colleagues of us with uh, Yuval Oreg and Gilad Magalit and Moti Ablum, um, we we uh, uh, came up with a picture that is uh, <laughs> that may explain this, um, uh, uh, and I'll let me just tell you what's what's coming. So so I'd like to tell you very quickly about this uh, picture because uh, uh, you know despite uh, uh, you know Juven's uh, uh, kindness, we do want to keep some reasonable time frame. Uh, so I'll tell you quickly about that, and then I'll, uh, I'll focus more on a more recent work, which is uh, uh, what happens at the uh, uh, finite temperature. Now, uh, <clears throat> so so the, the the picture we were trying to construct is uh, is uh, uh, um, getting the uh, pH Fafian as a phase that emerges in a, in a system uh, with disorder. So, so we, we imagine the, the following. We imagine that uh, for a clean system, um, as a function of uh, some parameter, for example, as a function of the filling factor, you have uh, uh, the, uh, two phases which are compatible with the numerical uh, works, uh, uh, Fafian for a certain range of filling factors and anti-Fafian for a different uh, range of filling factors separated by, by some kind of a first order uh, transition. Uh, now this, the the experimental system clearly has uh, some density modulations, long range density modulations, and therefore uh, the picture we we're trying to look at is a picture where you have puddles of uh, uh, Fafian and puddles of, of anti-Fafian, all of them within nucleus five of a uh, quantum hole state. Uh, so so so. Uh, uh, if, if there are patterns, there will be uh, interfaces, interfaces between uh, Fafian and anti-Fafian. The charge modes will be just counter propagating to one another, but the Majorana modes, because one carries minus one and the other carries plus three, at the interface, we're going to have four co-propagating Majorana modes and two counter propagating charge modes, or some set of counter propagating charge modes. Now, those counter-propagating charge modes can get one another 
by, by, by scattering, actually it, will, it should be a two electron scattering process. But anyway, the assumption is that they gap one another uh, and we are left only with uh, uh, the, the, the co-propagating uh, four neutral modes. Now, uh, of course, you know, you start with uh, some kind of uh, uh, democratic rule, uh, which means uh, if most of the system is a Fafian, if your frame factor along that axis is that most of the system is a Fafian and there are only anti Fafian puddles which are isolated, then the entire system would be a Fafian. And if most of it is anti Fafian, the entire system would be an anti Fafian. And at the interface, as you see, there would be four uh, uh, co propagating uh, marijuana modes. Now the question is what's going to happen at the transition. So at the clean, transi uh, the clean system, the transition was uh, just a transition from uh, you know, n equals minus one, the number of uh, my one modes to n equals plus three uh, or vice versa. Uh, and and uh, the key point in our picture is the statement that uh, if you have such a situation where uh, in Eddie. the clean system, Eddie, sorry, may yeah. I interrupt? Just make sure I, when I misread your sentence or misunderstand the previous slide, when you say the difference of a trend number is four, do you mean four times one half is two, or is actually really four? Yeah, no, no. Okay, the question is, what do you call the chain number? Four. Uh, number is four. Is two, do you count the number of uh, my one modes, or do you count the central chart? So, uh, uh, I mean, four my one modes. Okay, do I understand the, the question correctly? I just make sure the what's the trend number difference? How, how, how you count? Is, is that just four more animals or additional more? Four more animals, I think it should be trend number divided by two, right? It, uh, it's a question of how you define it. What I mean, the, the, probably the, the, the picture uh, expresses myself better than my words. Uh, I mean, four more animals. Okay, so it's okay. four times one half. I think the number should be two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's four times one half, yeah. Okay. In terms of uh, thermal oil conductance, it would be four times one half. Uh, so, so, so the, the, the picture we'd like to make is this, that uh, when you have a, a, a you know, what you, what you have here is the feeling factor uh, and disorder axis. Uh, and on the clean system, we said the assumption is that you go from Fafian to enter Fafian as you change the feeling factor. Now the statement is once you put in disorder, this transition, which is a jump of, uh, again, four in, in this counting of number of my modes, would break into four uh, mini transitions, each one changing uh, the thermal hole conductance by one half. So, you know, the Fafian has seven halves because it had uh, you know, two from the lowest Landau level uh, and, and, and one for, for the charge mode of the uh, half field Landau level and one of the marijuana modes. So that's altogether seven halves. Uh, the transition, instead of going from seven halves to three halves, of the anti Fafian, uh, once you have this order, the picture is the transition would be in jumps of one half, uh, which, which would give rise to such a, a structure where you have, as a function of this order, you have regions of Fafian uh, and then going to by one half, one half, one half, all the way uh, down to anti Fafian. And then at high enough disorder, all this gives. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gives way to a thermal metal. And we're going to talk about both of this, uh, both this and the thermal metal. Uh, now I should say that there, there are various uh, uh, either alternative pictures or, or even objections to, to this uh, by, by uh, uh, Chong Wang, uh, uh, actually Harvard work, uh, uh, and Ashwin and Bert, and, uh, and by uh, um, Steve, Steve Simon and collaborators, I won't get into, into these details. I just say this, this picture has the, uh, some uh, interesting consequences. I'll try to justify it in a minute, but, but let me just say uh, interesting consequences. Is you have a system that's made of puzzles which are of two phases, both of which are non-abelian. And yet the, the, the combined uh, phase you, you can get, uh, let's say if you're here, would be abelian. Or alternative, the alternative can happen too. You can have a, a, a system made of puddles which are abelian, and all together you'll get a non-abelian phase. Uh, now, uh, 
So, so, so how do we justify it uh, uh, quickly? Um, so, so uh, uh, this breaking of the transition from a transition of four to four mini transitions, you can uh, uh, most simply see it in a one dimensional system. If you go to one dimension class BD1, it's uh, one to one related to two dimensions class D, if you walk uh, uh, along the boat clock. Um, then, uh, but it's of course, it's one dimensional. Excuse me, so it's much easier to, to do numerics on. So if you take four one dimensional Kitaev chain uh, and, and couple them to one another in a way that uh, preserves a symmetry between them, you will get a, a transition from either all of them being trivial or all of them being uh, topological. Now, uh, if, if you then add disorder that preserves this uh, uh, symmetry only on average, but not uh, for a particular uh, uh, term in the disorder, then what, and, and you just solve it numerically, what you see is this, in the absence of disorder, as you tune in the uh, tuning parameter that takes you from all four chains being trivial to all four chains being topological, you have a single transition point. Uh, and uh, as you put in disorder, this single transition point, again, as a function of this tuning parameter, breaks into uh, four uh, different transitions. And uh, 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 what you see plotted here is the inverse localization length as a function of the tuning parameter. This is a transition where uh, you, you get the localization. And uh, you see that it breaks into four different transitions and they become more and more pronounced. The difference becomes more and more pronounced as you uh, make the disorder uh, stronger. Uh, so, so this is similar to what I showed you before here. As you turn on disorder, the, the single transition breaks into four. Now you can see a similar situation. Uh, actually, people saw similar situations before us in the two-dimensional context in a quantum hole transition uh, in graphene when you introduce uh, interval scattering or uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, um, spin orbit uh, coupled the uh, Landau levels in the absence of a G factor where you have a transition from equal zero to equal two and disorder breaks it to two different transitions. Uh, so so uh, 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 again, this allows you to, uh, uh, this opens the possibility to this uh, um, uh, um, intriguing uh, scenario where you get the non-abelian phases out of a mixture of abelian ones. Now, as I said, uh, as you put this order stronger and stronger at some point, you'll get in, into what's known as a thermal metal. This is how things happen in a class D superconductor. And in a thermal metal, kappa XY, the thermal hole conductance, uh, is not quantized at all. So, so, so now we can imagine several scenarios of how the system may choose to, to, to uh, um, walk along this uh, phase diagram uh, as you change your parameter, magnetic field, gate voltage, whatever. So you, you can have a situation that the situation that I talked about so far, which is a, a, you, you cross along here. So you cross uh, between four, you basically break the single transition from kappa xy of seven halves to three halves uh, into four different transitions going to, uh, you know, uh, three, five halves, uh, two, three halves. That, but that's one possibility, but there are other possibilities. Uh, there's a possibility that the system would choose to go first into a thermal metal region and then into a five half region, particle hole Fafian region, like observed in the experiment, and then back into a thermal metal, and then you'd have only uh, two transitions, as you can see here. And you can also have a situation where it would choose to go uh, only along a thermal metal, so that instead of having a transition, you would have just a, a, a continuous uh, crossover because you go through a metal where there's no quantization of kappa x, y whatsoever. And in fact, it's this last scenario, which I'd like to uh, talk about now for a few minutes. And the reason I'd like to talk about, about it is uh, that um, uh, this, this uh, scenario leads to an interesting uh, temperature dependence. Uh, 
Uh, so that belongs to, to a, a different piece of work. Uh, yes. Question, just to make sure. So here, the figure you show this plot about the Samoho conductance, uh, this uh, trans the, the jump or the transition. Uh, somehow, when you go from maybe this uh, Fabian to pH Fabian like Samoho to anti Fabian like Samoho, the seven half, five half, three half, somehow you, uh, you suggest they should always go through some symbol metal region, is that right? No, I'm not saying uh, always. Uh, 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 I'm not saying which of these scenarios is, is actually going to be realized in, in a particular experiment. Uh, we're examining different scenarios. I don't think we can say which, uh, which scenario will actually be realized. For example, the, the top three figures, the, the, the plot you showed, maybe the second one and third one, can you just go from seven half to three half without going through some, uh, uh, some, some range of the thermal metal with some transition in your opinion? So, so in principle, I think, uh, I don't see why this scenario, the first one would be, you know, right. in principle. Sure. principle. Yeah, uh, right, for the figure you show, it doesn't, but uh, I, I mean, uh, the, would, you, would you suggest the, the, the current maybe numerics or experiment suggest that's not possible? And that's kind of proposal maybe we had with uh, Billion and other people, and also the, maybe Tongwang has similar situation that can seven hour go to five hour without go to some simple method. It's, it's, ooh, 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 it has, ooh. has been wrong, well, it's not, it's, 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 it's still possible. That's kind of information I should get from you. Yeah. So, so, so we cannot tell you that either of these uh, scenarios that, I, that uh, I were drawn here are impossible. They are all possible in principle. What we can uh, do, and that's what I'd like to do, is to examine consequences. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about uh, the, I see. How about the, the one slide figure you showed earlier? That that one is uh, Ostrov Ostrovsky uh, data. Which one? Uh, the one maybe one slide later. Okay. Uh, maybe one more. Hey, sorry. Maybe two, two ah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ostrovsky. Yeah. This this one is this. Uh, Experiment numerics or just uh, okay. this is numerics, this is numerics, and uh, but remember this is class A. Oh, I see. Okay, it, it, you know, it's, it's it just quantum holds. It, it has a U one, hmm. additional U one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so 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 now uh, what I'd like to to look at is uh, uh, the the temperature dependence in the case where uh, the the system goes through a thermal method. Uh, and and uh, the key point that I'd like to emphasize here that what we find is that as you increase the temperature, the thermal metal may actually show something that looks pretty quantized, not, not perfectly quantized, it's a, a, a finite temperature result, but, uh, but shows some quantization. Uh, so that's what, what I'd like to show now. And, uh, and uh, um, as, as, a, as a starting point, um, let me just remind you how temperature affects quantization in the simplest case of all, which is the case of uh, uh, the integer quantum wall effect. So, so you know, uh, generally, uh, the more dissipative uh, uh, conductance you have, the worse off you are in terms of quantization. So let's look at the dissipative part of the conductance uh, and and. Uh, conclude, you know, this is the enemy of quantization. So let's look at it. Uh, so uh, what determines how much uh, dissipation you have is the interplay of two things, is localization and, and thermal uh, distribution. So uh, uh, for, for Landau level, you have uh, an energy where the localization length diverges and you, you have a, a region of energy uh, uh, of width of the temperature around the chemical potential, which is the region where uh, your transport takes place. Now, if the chemical potential is far enough from the region of delocalization, this is the energy axis, this is localization length, and this is the derivative of the Fermi function. So if the uh, chemical potential is far enough from the de de delocalized energy, then you will have very little dissipation. And if you decrease the temperature, you have even less because the, the, the Fermi function will get 
uh, more uh, picked and, and in particular narrower. So, so uh, uh, the, the lower the temperature is, uh, the better quantization you will uh, find. Now, uh, this picture of the integer quantum one effect has two differences from what we are talking about. We're talking about thermal conductance, not electrical conductance. Uh, and we're talking about the class D superconductor not class A, which means the chemical potential is pinned to, to zero energy. Uh, so, so that's not, uh, you know, we cannot uh, play with the, with, with the chemical potential. Uh, so, oops. So, so, so we'd like to look at, uh, at, uh, what, at how this transition takes place. And the, the case we, we looked at uh, is a, a, a class D superconductor, uh, uh, basically marijuana, uh, marijuana fermions on a hexagonal lattice uh, with a, a basically ordained model for, for a, a marijuana fermions, where we have nearest neighbor coupling and next nearest neighbor coupling and by tuning this next nearest neighbor coupling this is our tuning parameter that will take us from a, a, a 2d superconductor with a chain number of minus one in my convention which is minus one half probably in the more precise uh, language and, and and plus one half uh, so so this is a, a, the transition and we'd like to put in disorder in these two parameters and see uh, and look at the, uh, at the thermal metal that's being generated by the disorder. Uh, uh, yes. So yeah. there's a question from uh, Hank Chen. Maybe Hank can go ahead to ask. Yeah, it's just that um, maybe a naive question. In uh, one of the previous slides, you mentioned that the uh, the transition between um, states with thermal hole conductance that are fractional or quantized transitions between them are first order right that that's the assumption that we have that in the clean system it's probably a first order transition mm -hmm. and what about like the uh, the transition into a thermal metal do we know what kind of transition that is or uh if 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 we if we know it's not me <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, so 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 uh, so we we look at this model. We put in a disorder of uh, uh, in these parameters v one and v two, and 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 we find the uh, uh, two features that identify a thermal metal. The first one, if we look at the uh, you know we take a, a, a some some uh, cylinder and look at the transmission through that cylinder which is a way of measuring localization basically. And, and we look at, this is this tuning parameter V2, uh, and this is disorder. And we look at the transmission at zero energy, only at zero energy, the other energies will wait for this. Uh, so only at zero energy. Uh, and what we see is, uh, you know, for uh, in disorder free system, of course, uh, uh, the spectrum is gapped except at the transition and then at the transition, uh, there's a diacon, uh, but as you uh, uh, have disorder that's strong enough, you have a region where the uh, transmission is, is large, meaning the state is delocalized. The zero energy state is delocalized. Now we go to the next one, uh, and, and now we look at, uh, we, we put disorder somewhere at the, at the region where there is this metal, and now look at the transmission again as a function of the tuning parameter and of the energy. And we see that this delocalization takes place only clo close to, to the transition, only at zero energy. Uh, so, so, and it's a transition uh, uh, from, from a, uh, it's a boredom transition, as you see here, from minus one to plus one that goes through a thermal metal. But in that metal, only the zero energy state is delocalized. Uh, so, so we're looking at the thermal metal phase. And, and, and the properties of that phase are the following. First, the localization link diverges at, at zero energy for, for a, an infinite, a system of infinite size. Uh, and, and, and it's peaked at zero energy. So even close to zero energy, it's, it's relatively large. Now, the understanding uh, uh, of this uh, divergence or the behavior of the uh, localization length is the following. So very clear, at zero energy, basically, you have a, 
uh, weak anti-localization coming out of interference of uh, uh, time-averse trajectories uh, 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 because of particle hole symmetry. It's, it's, it's basically like uh, systems with spin orbit at class A2. Um, so so, so uh, uh, as long as you are at low energies, the, the interference of uh, an electron that does a trajectory in a hole that does the opposite trajectory uh, is destructive and you get weak anti-localization for energies which are low enough uh, and it, the uh, uh, low uh, how low you need to go depends on what's the size of the system. Now at higher energies, you already forgot the, you know, if you are at high energy, the, the electron interferes only with itself, cannot interfere with the whole of the other side of the spectrum. And therefore you just uh, uh, have a system that doesn't know anymore about particle hole symmetry of class D and, and basically behaves like a class A. So at high energy, you have a class A localization and the localization length goes like the uh, square of the uh, conductance and I won't get into details, but uh, 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 so at high energies localization at uh, low energies, the localization length diverges. Uh, as you increase the system size, the, the, the peak close to zero energy gets uh, uh, bigger because the state is delocalized. Uh, and, and oops, um, uh, we may need to take a two minutes break because I'll uh, have to get a charger, but uh, uh, let's continue for, for and see how long it, it lets me. Uh, so, 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 uh, let me actually check how I check. Uh, so, 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 uh, 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 um, so, 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 as we increase the system size, the 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 peak gets narrower and and uh, higher. Um, uh, now, what we'd like to to look at, as we did before, now we'd like to look at dissipative thermal conductance, and dissipative thermal conductance has, a, a, you know, you can write it as an integral over all energies of, of, of a, again, the, the a derivative of the, uh, of the Fermi function multiplied by the transmission, but now multiplied by another factor, this factor of E squared. And the reason for this is this, if you look at electric conductance, you, uh, uh, an electron that moves from one side to the other brings a charge and, and the, all electrons have the same charge. If you look at thermal conductance, it counts what is the energy that the electron brings with it. And you have to weigh in that energies. So that gives you this factor of, of uh, E squared, it turns out. So, so uh, 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 the, the, the dissipative conductance is a product of these two factors. One factor that emphasizes the energies of the order of, the order of temperature because it's E squared times derivative of the Fermi function and the other factor that emphasizes zero energy because this is where uh, the localization, localization length diverges. If you uh, allow me just a second, uh, David, maybe we can get my charger. Yeah. It connects to the uh, docking station. Okay. okay. Um, uh, um, Sorry for that, uh, and I hope we are not going to get into trouble. Uh, so, so, so uh, uh, the the dissipative part of the conductance then is is a product of these two. Now, as you uh, so, and that's how it looks. This is the uh, peak of the localization length diverging, and this is the uh, e squared times the derivative of the Fermi function. Now, if you fix L and uh, you increase temperature, those two peaks of the thermal function move away. So you get less dissipative thermal conductance, which means you'll get good quantization. So you increase the temperature and you improve your, your situation. You, you get a better uh, um, uh, quantization. Now, uh, as you, you, you can uh, see, there's a, an issue of order of limits here uh, because uh, uh, if you increase the temperature fixing the system side,
Hey, Adi's um, computer just died, so he's about to get the charger. So hopefully he'll be back with us um, in a couple of seconds. Yeah, I'm gonna try because I tried to tell them that you are um, talking and so am I being seen? Oh uh, yes, we are still following you. Following you. Uh, so I apologize for this. Okay, can you make the volume louder? Uh, that's the maximum volume. Okay. Uh, so so I apologize for this, but the batteries run out and somehow we were not prepared apparently for such a long uh, seminar. So so I, but but I basically told you. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, I wanted to say, which is uh, uh, as you increase the temperature, you improve the, the, the uh, level of your quantization. Now, uh, uh, the, the only last ingredient, which uh, I, I'll explain with my hands, is uh, that as the system size gets too large, interactions introduced as usual with the with localization, introduce phase breaking and limit the system size to, to a, a, the phase breaking length. Uh, once the phase breaking length is larger than the localization length, you get this uh, favorable situation that uh, I mentioned where quantization uh, gets better with increasing temperature. Now, uh, this is all what I wanted to say about thermal uh, uh, conductance. Uh, and, and what I'd like to uh, do now is to turn over to David uh, while I go and look for my charger. Uh, and, and David will tell you about uh, uh, charge measurements uh, in, in mesoscopic uh, devices. So you have your presentation. Right? Yeah. Actually, before I do so, maybe Juven, let me know what, since our uh, time is already up, uh, you know, what's the situation with regard to that? So please, go, please keep going. Just keep going as planned. Yes. Okay, so I'll do that. So people okay. can leave if they want, but uh, the talk will be recorded so they can watch. Okay, fair enough. All right. Can you see my, uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So in the final part of the talk, I'll want to talk about. Um, some work we are doing together with my student Misha uh, about whether one can actually identify the or rule out the pH Fafian topological order in charge transport alone. But so far, we've always been focusing on thermal transport because all of the possible five half states have the same electrical conductance. So, naively, you want to imagine that there's no way I can tell them apart by electrical measurements. I need to measure something thermal in order to probe the neutral modes. So, here I want to tell you about that this 
need not be the case. And when the focus on the unique property of, of the pH Fafian, which is that it's direct edge, namely it's edge with nucleus two, and it's whole conjugate edge, namely the edge with nucleus three, are actually the same. And you know, we're, this is kind of based on um, related work on, uh, on the two thirds quantum also. Okay, so this is the kind of device that, uh, that you want to look at. So this is, um, uh, there's a region of nucleus two, there's a region of new equals three, and then there's a five half region in the middle. And we just want to ask as we uh, put in some current from the source S, where does it arrive? So, you know, it can only arrive at D1 or D2, not at D3, just because of the chirality of the modes. So the question is just how much of the current uh, being sourced from the S will arrive at D1, or what's the, what's the conductance between S and D1? So before even doing a calculation, one can, you know, think about kind of more generally what can happen. Firstly, the conduction must be, uh, the conductance must be between zero and one because there's a single integer um, leaving, leaving the source and entering the drain. Uh, and more, moreover, if the system is very, very long, so the dissipation is effective, right? It's longer than some term length, such that at every point we can define local chemical potential, then the conductance is just determined by the filling factors, kind of like a, like a bottleneck. So in that case, the conductance is going to be one half, and it's one half regardless of uh, the number of my animals. So this, this number is indeed doesn't distinguish between any of the possible phases. Now I can also think about the opposite limit if the length of this interacting region, so L is the length between the top left and the top right of the, of the five half region, if it shrinks all the way to zero, then I have just a point contact uh, where the five half meets uh, the nuclear three state. And such a point contact, I can just look at the scaling dimension of an electron that needs to tunnel across to change the conductance. And for any of these fractional states, the scaling of dimension of the electron is, is too large, larger than one half, meaning that such tunneling is irrelevant. <clears throat> so for such contact, the conductance is, um, is always one. And that's again, independent of <clears throat> the topological order. So in these two limits, we cannot distinguish what's going on based on electric measurements. <clears throat> So now I want to look at what happens at zero temperature. And for this result to change, for this low result to change, what we need is there's some additional length scale at which point it will change, right? So in order to see whether we have such a length scale, I'll you know, use my favorite trick, which is this change of basis um, along this horizontal edge. So after doing that, I have some number of my runner fermions sitting over here, right, n plus two. And now I have the two situations. The first one is that this number is, is, is larger than zero, which, meaning, which means that these Majorana fermions, the n Majorana fermions, the original ones, uh, move in the same direction as the two that I get from my change of basis. And in such case, all the Majoranas move in the same direction. Um, they are protected from localization and essentially nothing can happen. Like I don't get any new length scales. So in this case, I expect the, um, this point contact result to hold. But if n is negative, then I have both left and right moving my runners, and they can localize each other, and there'll be an associated localization length. Right? So, in the, so in this case, in this configuration, I'll have a new length scale only when n is negative. So or, or only for the pH Fafian, for the anti Fafian, but not for the Fafian. Now, in the opposite configuration, uh, the same consideration uh, leads me to the conclusion that I do have such a length scale, but only for Fafian and pH Fafian. So we can see that the pH function is, is special in that it has this, this new length scale um, in both configurations in, bay, in A and B, right? So I haven't yet told you that something important happens there, but at least there's a potential for something to happen. Namely, there's this new length scale uh, where stuff can happen. Okay, so with these considerations, now let's actually try to determine what the conductance of, of this model. So I just you know, write down this interface and I just label the currents uh, at any given point by, you know, as I've shown over here, like the, the incoming current, the outgoing current, um, the, the, you know, the current at the interface, and again, the currents into D2 and D3. Now, the current from the source to X1, that one is conserved because there's nothing, nothing going on there. Likewise, uh, the current between X2 and D1, there's nowhere it can go. But of course, the currents, uh, the two currents, the right going, the left going one at the intermediate region, they, then they need not be conserved. Right. And that's uh, going to be where everything interesting is going to come in. If they were conserved, then of course we would always have unit conductance. <clears throat> so I have my currents. I just uh, at these boundaries, I just write on the boundary conditions that you know, that that they match up. 
and in between uh, stuff, stuff can happen. So just you know, the incoming one at this boundary is just the same as the right going one. The left going one is just the same as the one that goes to D2 uh, and so on. I do. Uh, David, excuse me, just make sure. Yeah. Yes, exactly this uh, two situations somehow. Let me just make sure there's a little uh, maybe junction gap between new code three and new code five hub earlier. And then now in this slide, there is what? no such a junction. Is, is there a junction that you potential you purposefully show between new code three and new code five hub with new code two in between? The small. Uh, no, I don't need to show it. This, this is, I mean, this again is just equivalent way of representing the edge, right? It's, I, it's, I find it easy to think about okay. the new code five half region. First, it's decoupled, and then I move it closer and closer, such that they may interact. Right? If they decouple, then the conductance is one. But if they move closer and closer, if, if this is the nucleus two becomes one, one, then they will interact. And in that case, this basis, this right left basis, may no longer be a good basis. I can, you know, I'm free to use anything I want. But in that case, it becomes more appropriate to use a, a new basis in terms of the total charge in neutral modes. Right? So, so what exactly is, is a device really look like? There's the device, no the device yeah. will have uh, there's no junction. There's no junction. Yeah, there's, 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 uh, you know, the five half okay. goes directly all the way to nucleus three. Right. Thanks. Okay. So now I do again do my transformation to the charge in neutral modes and just revise my boundary conditions accordingly. Right, so, so far, nothing much has happened. And then I notice that at this edge here, the charge current is actually conserved. The charge current can't go anywhere. There's a chiral flow of charge, but the charge current is also conserved around the interface. And since nothing is coming out of D3, the charge current is precisely the same as the outgoing current. Now, once I plug this in, the boundary condition that I have collapsed uh, to very simple ones. And there's a boundary conditions only that relate the incoming current, the outgoing current, and what happens with the neutral current. These are, these are the, the boundary conditions I arrive after just this kind of matching. And this is already kind of remarkable, you know, two equations. They are firstly, they're pretty simple, but what they, what they tell you is that the relationship between the incoming current and the outgoing current, that these are just the, you know, the electronic currents, I, uh, I in is the one that I'm sourcing uh, by my voltage, and I out is the one that I want to measure or to get my conductance. They actually depend on what's happening in the neutral sector. In this sense, um, they are sensitive, or they may be sensitive, to um, to what's going on with the neutral sector. So, to before we kind of you know, see what happens in the interesting cases, let's do a sanity check. Let's see what happens in this kind of complicated basis when I don't actually have any coupling between the integer mode and the fractional modes. So, in the new basis, in the new basis, this just means that there's no coupling between the two myrans at the interface and these n myranas, which I had uh, right from the start um, from this five half state. And if there's no coupling, then of course the neutral current must also be conserved along the interface from right to left. And then the outgoing current it follows from these boundary conditions is exactly the same as, as the ingoing current. And that, you know, we knew that from the start, it's just a sanity check that indeed, um, you know, this, this kind of, you know, maybe more cumbersome formulation allows us to reproduce um, what, we, what we knew to be true uh, to begin with. But now we can move on to the more interesting case, which is that we do have actual um, interactions uh, at the edge uh, between these Majoranas. And there are two cases. One is that we have less than two left moving Majoranas after the hybridization, or equivalently, that uh, the number n is negative, which is to say these Majoranas down here move oppositely to the, to the ones um, which I'm getting from the base change. And in that case, you know, once I write everything out, I only have a single Majorana moving from the right to the left. Right? There's only a single Majorana mode. And the single Majorana mode can't, can't transfer any, any current. The single Majorana, you can view it as there's an equal chance, say if I have a, you know, a neutral particle over here, they can arrive on the other side as either a hole or as a, as a particle with equal probability, which means that the current it transfers must be exactly zero, up to maybe exponential small corrections. Right? So, or you know, can differently put, a Z2 channel cannot really transfer any U1 information. And that means that the, the, this neutral current at the left side must be zero. And from this, it follows directly from these boundary conditions that the outgoing current is one half of the ingoing current, which is to say that the conductance is one half. Right? So in this particular mm -hmm. case, uh, I'm also getting this as a value conductance one half, but now I'm not getting it as a as a kind of classical high temperature result, but this is a, a quantum mechanical zero temperature result, which holds when this n is negative. Now, by contrast, uh, when the n is positive, we again, it's a situation where we only have um, co-propagating Majoranas, 
and then everything remains um, remains critical, right? There's no no length scale involved, which means that I can deduce what happens by performing some RD transformation. I'm just going to lower and lower energies, and effectively, I'm just shrinking uh, the size of the interacting region all the way until I have just the point contact left. And then we're back to the point, as I already mentioned, if I just have a point contact, I can just look at, is the tunneling of electrons between these edges relevant? And since we know it's irrelevant, that means that um, the, in the, you know, the, the incoming current must put, put, uh, proceed all the way to D1, uh, or the conductance is one. Right, so this is again a binary choice. Uh, the n is negative, give me one half, and the n is positive or zero, I'm getting um, d equals one. So there's also an unstable fixed point, but let me just, just skip that in the interest of time. And if I, I can do exactly the same analysis now for the device, where I'm instead I'm interchanging the filling factors nu and nu, two, nu equals two and nu equals three. So at this point, at this horizontal edge, you know, I'm having instead the interface, uh, you know, kind of the particle hole conjugate interface of what I had before. And the same computation will give me again the values g equals one half and g equals one, but differently across the phases. For the Pfaffian, we get g equals one in one case and one half in the other case. For the pH Pfaffian, that's again the, the special one, we get g equals one half in those cases. And the anti Pfaffian, we get one half in the one and one in the other. All right, so this is kind of you know, relatively basic quantity. The electrical conductance will take actually different quantized values in these configurations depending on which phase we have. And in particular, if you measure these two devices, we'll be able to tell uh, whether we have uh, the Pafian uh, or the anti uh, or the pH Pafian. Right. So one can uh, change this a little bit. I can replace this nu equals two by nu equals zero. Some of the numbers change a little bit, but the ability to distinguish the phases remains the same. It's always, if I have one integer which is smaller than five, than, than five half and the other one is larger than five half, it will allow me to, um, to distinguish these two phases if I'm measuring in kind of these two types of configurations where once I have the interacting edge between five half and, and the lower integer and once between uh, the higher integer. So, you know, it's, um, there's, this is the basic thing. I can con kind of combine two copies of that to turn it into um, kind of an electronic scattering experiment. So in such a two terminal configuration, I only have electrons coming in, electrons coming out in all possible ways. So there's just gonna be a scattering matrix, or in this case, it's even simpler. It's just a, you know, a scattering probability of going from left to right or a reflection probability. And here's the same device just drawn in two different limits. One is where the electronic modes want to fully transmit and there's the island over here and I may allow them to weakly couple. And the other case, they want to just come back and there's the island in the middle, but again, I may allow them weakly to, to weakly couple. And the question is just, if I introduce such weak coupling between these integers and the charge modes, um, will it destabilize this, this perfect conductance or perfect um, reflecting, or will it uh, leave it more or less unchanged? And the result is follows from what we already did. Um, in the Fafian case, it will, like the first configurations will be stable, and we remain remain perfectly transmitting, except for like specific energies, kind of sharp resonances where I will have transmission. So essentially the modes remain decoupled, but I have a quantum dot. So I have sharp energies where I may still reflect uh, once I hit them. In the anti profit case, it's the opposite. So I will, so this configuration will be unstable, but this one will be stable. So I will mostly reflect, but there'll be sharp resonances where I can transmit uh, through this um, uh, finite size island in the middle. And finally, if I take the pH Pfaffian, they're actually both unstable. So that's maybe the most interesting case. Both the perfect transmitting and the perfectly reflecting fixed point are unstable. Like the modes always strongly hybridize with the pH Pfaffian island, and you'll find a value of the, uh, the transmission probability, which is one half, and you don't get any kind of, you know, any resonance. You don't get any of these kind of, you know, finite size energy peaks that will give you sharp transmission or reflecting. So it's a very qualitative, um, you know, way of, of distinguishing these ways in an experiment which has maybe the appealing feature is just, you know, two terminal electronic um, transmission or, or reflecting coefficient. Okay, so there's, there's one caveat to all this that I was doing my calculations um, at, at zero temperature. Um, and the question is, what does zero temperature mean? In particular, I told you that 
I may get different answers uh, in this high temperature incoherent regime. So how can I tell if I measure, say, the value one half, that it's a zero temperature or low temperature value for pH Fafian or a high temperature incoherent value for, you know, for any of the phases that doesn't discriminate. And there are kind of two ways one can think about. The first one, one can ask, how does the temperature, how does the conductance change with temperature? So if it's governed by this zero temperature kind of quantum mechanical pH function state. There's a zero temperature fixed point and temperature is the perturbation which will change my conductance away from this value. So this delta G will increase with temperature. Now in the incoherent regime, I'm governed by a high temperature fixed point or the kind of classical fixed point. And their increasing temperature will get me closer to that fixed point. So there the quantization will be better and delta G will, will decrease with temperature. So in principle, this temperature dependence will already uh, tell me whether I'm either co near a coherent fixed point or an incoherent fixed point. Of course, in, in, in principle, if one really wants to, go, go, to to make sure that stuff is coherent, the standard way would be to try to build in some kind of interferometer. So here I am having a, a picture where I'm adding an additional integer. And in this case, um, an electron can either move along this complicated uh, interacting edge or it can move alternatively along the simple integer branch. And if these two electrons can interfere, then it means that, uh, that the electron maintains coherence as it moves along this fractional edge and the entire system is coherent. So if you measure coherence and you measure the value one half, that would again tell you that you are, um, that you actually have the, the pH Fafian state. You know, if you measure this in the two configurations, one with uh, you know, nu equals two, nu equals three as shown, and one so with nu equals two and nu equals three um, interchanged. Okay, so that's um, that's basically what I did in a kind of a lightning run through in the interest of time, and I just want to you know show you the the things that we talked about over this long period. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, what the experiments which strongly favor pH Fafian and which conflict with, uh, with the numerics, which you know like Fafian anti Fafian really seem to um, you know do not like the pH function very much. Um, Ali talked about uh, how this order may introduce uh, you know, non-abelian topological phases, even when there's a kind of microscopic local topological order is abelian, or uh, in the case that uh, may be relevant for these experiments, if the local order is in a certain abelian, non-abelian phase, and instead uh, after these puddles, we get uh, you know, this pH function, a different non-abelian phase. We talked about how a thermal metal, a phase which is not actually um, you know, sharply quant, not sharply quantized at zero temperature, may nevertheless disguise its non-abelian topological order and exhibit uh, thermal Hall conductance, which is pretty well quantized. So I didn't actually get to show you these kind of things. These are kind of curves which are which are which are indicating kind of numerically in this time in this in this non-interacting model how the conductance at uh, kappa x y the actual kind of transverse uh, thermal conductance uh, changes with temperature. And you can see that over a wide range of low temperature values, they kind of all flow to the same um, high temperature values. So that's kind of the improving of quantization. And that's the resulting um, kind of finite temperature phase diagram that you would get on top of this, um, this order story. And finally, uh, I briefly mentioned how, um, how charge transport in a suitable um, this copy device may actually tell us something about the neutral mode content and thereby about the non-abelian topological order uh, of the five half state. Thanks, Sophia. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, questions from the audience? Maybe before the question, I'd like, I'd like to apologize on behalf of my computer. <laughs> I'm going to buy a new battery. <laughs> Please feel free to ask if you find your question appropriate. Any questions on the chat? Uh, but seem to more compelled discussion is something about Carnot engine, ah. something like that. I had one question actually. Uh, can you hear it? Hear me? Yes. Uh, so uh, you in this uh, the last few slides you have shown us there are many different interfaces that you use to identify uh, uh, the different uh, 
Fafian and Fafian and Page Fafian. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, is it possible that the interfaces uh, might introduce new uh, modes which only lives on the interface? Not like the interfaces were designed assuming that let's say uh, the modes of the five off and you bring the mucus to two modes close enough so that you can interact between them and uh, just renormalize or redefine them. But sometimes interfaces can have uh, uh, non-trivial modes that only live on the interface, right? You're talking about edge reconstruction, essentially. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that's always the possibility, which you know, which um, which one always has to deal with. I guess uh, you know, from from a theoretical perspective, at zero temperature, you can just make the edge as long as you want, and you know, if you're as long as you want, then only topologically um, protected stuff will survive, and therefore you can kind of rule this out right? because they are not going to survive. In experiments, it may be more of a concern because probably just the requirement of being coherent at the temperatures you have will limit the length of the edge. And at a shorter edge, you know, you you may have those extra modes, and then we we'll need to worry about them. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, it's Yuval. So uh, you study the um, the conductance. You, you said that the tunneling um, will be always irrelevant. But is the dimension depend on the on the state, and can you measure that? I mean, the dimension will certainly depend on depend on the state, uh, and uh, so I mean that's I guess one of the ways how people try to look to identify this kind of state, right? By by tunneling into them and trying to identify the tunneling exponent. Now, unfortunately, the this. It, you never quite get any of the exponents that the theory actually predicts. You always get a slightly modified exponent, which is attributed to interactions. So, yeah. so it's, I don't think it's, uh, it, it seems to not have worked as a clear cut way of identifying the phases just from, just from this power, just from this exponent. This is the Radu experiment, which I mentioned before. Uh, yeah, yeah, but here you remove many of the edge modes, right? It's all what remains is this uh, one half state. So it's, be, the exponents will be different, right? Could be. I mean, the, the concern that was mentioned before of uh, having various uh, spurious edges, uh, which are not fully get, you know, edge reconstruction may, may complicate this. But in principle, you know, at the theory level, uh, the power will, will identify uh, or will be different for different orders. Any further questions? Let me ask one on um, about the proposal that, that David had in the very end about the charge transport. Uh, so how how close we are to have an experimentalist to uh, try to perform this measurement? Well, we, you know. then, I mean, we talk, we discussed this with, with Smarty, and you know, maybe he'll do it. We we hope so, but you know, but he has also of course many other things that that, that he wants to do. So I think it's it's all it's all feasible. I think that you know we, when we discussed this with, with this group, it, you know, nothing of it seems like oh this is outrageous. You can't do this. But of course, if you try to do this, you'll you know at first try to do the simpler cases. You know, try to do it with say the, the one third case where there's prediction already from this work by uh, by our colleague Ivan Geffen and, and Tasha Millen and, and their collaborators. So you know, so I don't think you can expect to kind of get this to be the thing that identifies the phase you know in the very near future. So you could probably need to be a bit more patient and probably get that. And then there's also the question, given that there is now uh, a very large number of experiments that already um, you know, suggest the pH function, um, where the, what the incentive is. And finally, I guess one would hope that since all these experiments that, that, that support pH function are kind of from the one group, you know, our hope is that maybe there'll be some other group kind of to, to pick it up to give some, some independent uh, input on this question. Should be said, by the way, talking about other groups, that it would be nice to see experiments done also on other materials. So I, I actually I had a question about it. If if there were if yes, you could do, give you <laughs> if, if there was an interface, for example, between five half and and another 
uh, you know, can it, like let's say 5F and minus 5F. Would that give uh, additional information? Is this something you know, that can help clarify the phase of, of uh, one of them? So five halves and minus five halves? For example, you, you have several even denominators, uh, right? also in gallium arsenide, right? and, you, and you can interface one with the other. So yeah, does this- Five halves and seven halves. It can, no, I know. I, I mean, in general, interfaces between two even denominators. Yeah. The, the, the point is you'll get all these chart modes. Um, Again, which, uh, which you want to eliminate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would also say the problem is you interface two guides that you don't know. It's very, you know, here we're kind of trying to see, okay, we, we know a couple of things and hope to identify the last one. If you have two players in the game which you don't really know, then it might be, you might get some kind of global information that, you know, either, you know, it's, it's a product of the ends is something or the sum of the ends is something. I think you'll have a hard time identifying each of their phases on their own. Okay. No, I was thinking maybe there is some. I, I don't know. I have thought about this one. It would be like a you know, random first response. Okay. All right. I think we should uh, be grateful and thank the Debbie, Debbie and the AD for the wonderful seminar first. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also, I, I didn't right. say it in the beginning. Thanks for your Hebrew speech. Yeah, let's <laughs> compose everything I can remember. <laughs> yeah, no good. Thank you. And uh, people can still stay if they want to ask more questions, and let me close the. Line.